I'd like to welcome everyone and especially to welcome our invited guest, Carolyn Uller, who is formerly an associate professor at MIT and just recently came back to Europe to join ETH Zurich as a professor of machine learning statistics and genomics. So we're very happy to have you with us here today, Dr. Uller and looking very much forward to your talk on multi-domain data integration from observations to me mechanistic insights and an area of great interest to me. So thank you for agreeing to come. Thank you very much, Levi, for this introduction and for inviting me to speak here. Um, so what I thought I'll do is I'll start with the kind of motivation for the kinds of methods we've been developing in terms of multi-domain data integration and then uh, go from there. Um, so something that has really excited me over the last um, couple, well, maybe five years or so is this question of like, you know, how is it that we all have the same 1D information, namely the genome inside each one of our cells, but we have all these huge variety of different cell types and different cell states, et cetera, that make up our body. And what I think is really exciting is that, you know, nowadays with all the single cell technologies, we can actually look at these single cells um, in the tissue and outside of the tissue. We can look at it in terms of imaging. Um, we can look at it in terms of expression and all kinds of different data modalities. And not only can we look at them in terms of observation and get observational data, um, but we can even perform interventions like, say, a knockout intervention or a drug intervention, etc., and see how the cell changes after a particular intervention. Um, and so I think what, one of the big challenges, though, when you think about this kind of data is that many of these measurements are highly destructive to the cell. Right. So, for example, um, you can still not get um, say DAPI staining and RNA-seq done in the same cell. Um, also, you know, once you collect its um, RNA-seq profile, then of course um, you cannot also look at how this cell would look like after a particular intervention. So say, for example, if I do a knockout experiment, I have to decide whether I look at a particular cell before the knockout or after the knockout, but I cannot do this both in the same cell. Right? So you have this um, very big kind of data integration problem where you, know, you have a population of cells and now from this population of cells, I can decide, you know, I can take some out for imaging and others out for say sequencing, but I can still not do both in the same cell. Right? So I need to somehow integrate these different views of cells um, in order to get a, um, a full picture of what these cells are. Um, same thing when you have interventional data, right? I have a population of cells. I take some out for sequencing before the intervention, some out for sequencing after the intervention, say a knockout. And again, I have this in data integration and translation question or problem where, you know, the kind of question I would really like to answer is, were I able to also sequence the cell before the intervention? How would this particular cell have looked like? Right? And the same questions also if you think about um, a process that evolves over time. Again, because these measurements are highly destructive, you'd never get to see these standard time series measurements. Like you don't usually get to see a cell and how it changes over time because once I take the image or you know, I, I sequence it, then I'm done with this cell, right? And I have to look at a different cell at, at a different time point. So again, it's the same question where, you know, from a population of cells at different time points where I sequence or image different kinds of cells, I would really like to be able to answer the question, how would this cell have looked like? Were I able to image it also at time point one or at time point two or at time point three? Okay, so I think all of these questions, because these measurements are so destructive, are always lead to some data integration and translation questions. And so those are the kinds of questions we've been working on quite a bit over the last years. Um, and so what I thought I'll do is first start with the kinds of questions where I'm just looking at one data modality and I'm asking, but in one data modality I have, and in this case it will be single cell RNA-seq, um, I'll have um, observational and interventional data, meaning I have, you know, large scale single cell RNA-seq data set, but I also have single cell RNA-seq after knocking out gene one, gene three, gene five, gene six, et cetera. 
And what I would really like to be able to do is from this data predict the effect of an on-scene intervention, right? You already have a lot of knockout into, um, data, but you know, you'll not be able to knock out any combination of genes, right? Um, that you just have a combinatorial explosion, but what you would like to still be able to do from such data is be able to answer the question, well, what would happen were I able to also, you know, knock out gene 10, 11, 12? Um, and um, am I actually able to do that, right? To predict this kind of um, new intervention effect. And when you think about this question of um, predicting the effect of an intervention, that's of course a causal question. Um, and so we've developed quite a bit of causal methods. So methods for actually learning the underlying causal graph from observational and interventional data. And so that's what I wanted to just give you a brief overview in the first part before I then go into how to integrate different data modalities. Okay, so if I want to, as I said, if I want to predict the effect of an intervention, so of a new intervention, so think of the problem like this. So I have some data um, where in some cells I have observational data and I have data where I did different kinds of interventions where, I, for example, knocked out different kinds of genes. What I would really like to be able to do is predict the effect of knocking out a different gene, okay, that I have not yet seen in my data set. Okay, so that seems like quite a hard problem. And when you talk about interventions, you have to take a, a causal, um, a causal uh, viewpoint uh, because you care about directions, right? Okay, so causal graphs um, can be represented. So, they, uh, so a causal frame network can be represented by a directed graph. And here I'm using the standard structural equation models that have been introduced, you know, already by Sewell Wright in the 1920s, where every node, think of it as a gene, is a random variable. And it's at every and a particular gene is a function, and it can be a highly nonlinear function of its parents um, in this graph. So in this case, x4 here is a function of x2 and x3 and some noise. Okay, because it's um, it's of course random, and the noise, of course, again, it doesn't have to be Gaussian, right? And in general, when you look at single cell RNA seq data, it's certainly not Gaussian. Okay, so this is the very, you know, standard and old model that I'm going to use, but I really want to use it in all its generality, namely here nonlinear functions and here, you know, any kind of noise that you want to have. Okay, now if you want to think about, um, you know, predicting the effect of an intervention, well, let's now set up um, a framework for actually thinking about interventions. And again, I'll, I'll come from the genomics perspective. So if I think of a knockout experiment, so that's a very invasive intervention, right? I'm actually going in and setting the value of a gene to zero. Okay, if you do that, you go in and set the value of a gene to zero, well, then it doesn't matter anymore what its parents do, right? Because I'm just set to zero. So I'm actually changing the graph structure. I'm actually removing all of the incoming edges to, to the node I'm intervening on, right? There is no more effect from anyone upstream of me. So that's a super invasive intervention that's known as a hard intervention where I'm actually changing the graph structure. Okay, and I'm removing all of the effect of all of the, all of my parents if I'm intervened on. Um, everything else is called a soft intervention. So think for example, a knockdown experiment um, where, sorry, in a knockdown experiment where, you know, I'm not changing the graph structure, right? I'm just, um, for example, changing the effect of how X1 acts on me, or I am uh, changing the noise in, in this variable here. Okay, so this is the framework that I'll use in order to think about interventions. So hard interventions, think of knockdown, knockouts, um, very invasive interventions, and then soft interventions. And so in genomics, we do have a whole lot of data, right? We have a whole lot of um, interventional data sets that are soft interventions, that are hard interventions. And the question I really want to be able to do is the following, right? I want to be able to predict the effect of an unseen intervention from interventional data itself. And I want to just give an overview on the kinds of things that we can do using this. Um, so first of all, in terms of experimental design, I think this is an interesting um, insight, um, which was maybe not so clear before in genomics, is that, um, you know, since these hard interventions are so much more invasive, right, if you think about how many knockouts can you perform in a single cell without the cell dying, it's usually not too many, right? Um, because it's so invasive. However, these knockdowns, you can actually perform quite a few if you don't perturb the genes too much. So it was kind of believed that um, the knockout experiments don't provide you as much, uh, provide you more information than the knockdown experiments um, with respect to the underlying causal structure or this gene regulatory network in the cell. 
but it turns out that's actually not the case. So what we proved is that these soft interventions provide just the same amount of causal information as these hard interventions, despite being less invasive. So I think this is an interesting insight from an experimental design perspective. And then we have um, algorithms also for inferring causal networks from a mix of observational and interventional data. So they're all available here. Um, all of these packages where you can really just put in, um, you know, all of your single cell RNA seq that is observational, all of your, say, knockout data, um, knockdown data, et cetera, um, and outcomes, um, a causal graph or a regulatory network. Now, of course, you can ask, well, how do we verify that whatever we're doing here is, is right? Um, so we're verifying it. So, of course, we don't have the true graph structure, right? So uh, that's why I always pose the question in the way I did here. Um, by being able to predict the effect of an unseen intervention. Um, oops, somehow everything is moving around and I don't have a mouse. Okay. By it being able to predict the effect of an unseen intervention. And that's exactly how we also draw ROC curves for our models. Okay, so we're not verifying the graph that comes out. The graph is um, something, this causal graph is something that then allows us to predict the effect of an unseen intervention. And that's also how we uh, validate or, or, you know, analyze our algorithms in terms of how well they perform. Okay, so we see this, uh, so we always define understanding the gene regulatory network as being able to accurately predict the effect of an unseen intervention. And that's exactly how we validate these algorithms. Um, also, you know, you can use these algorithms directly for learning differences of causal graphs. That's maybe very often actually more relevant maybe um, because you know you have maybe a data from a diseased state and a non-diseased state and really what you care about are the differences between them um, or you have data from different cell types and you actually care about the differences between them and so it doesn't make sense to learn two very large scale causal graphs just to take the difference right if the difference is small you should actually be learning them to separate uh, together so that's um, that's what you can also do with these kinds of algorithms as well um, and maybe another important thing where I think there is just still very, very little uh, work is this experimental design question, which I think is a very important one, um, which really requires a lot more work, is the question of, you know, of course, there are so many possible interventions that you could perform, right? So which ones are the ones that would give you the most information about the underlying gene regulatory network? Um, so we started looking into this, and this is certainly not the end of the story. Um, so here is just uh, one way of doing it by taking a Bayesian approach um, and taking the batched uh, setting where, and, and also where you have uh, constraints on costs, because, you know, often like the constraints that you have is say I have a budget for 100,000 cells that I can get. Um, I also have a budget for how many interventions I can perform. Um, and also I have a time budget, so that means maybe I can do four batches of experiments. And now what I would really want to know is for every batch, what is the optimal set of interventions that I should do, right, in order to learn the most about the underlying um, causal system or gene regulatory network. And then you get to see this information after one batch and then you decide again on the next interventions that you should perform. Now, in general, you can prove that this is an NP-hard problem, so you would have to actually enumerate all possibilities. Um, but uh, this problem has very nice structure, in particular, it's submodular, meaning that, you know, if you already have a lot of data from one intervention, then getting more data from that particular intervention doesn't give you as much um, back as if you get more data from an intervention where you have very little data until now. So this uh, diminishing returns property actually helps you that you can come up with a greedy algorithm that where you get guarantees on how far away you are from the optimal strategy. And then that way you can come up with a strategy that you can actually compute um, and, you know, does well in terms of, I mean, obviously not as well as the strategy where you enumerate all of your, all of your different kinds of interventions, but um, not, it's not too far off from that particular optimal strategy. But I think here there is still a whole lot to be done. In particular, this algorithm, maybe let me also say something about the, the, uh, the limitations of this. Um, in particular, what it cannot do is it always takes only into account um, the setting where you can just do an intervention on a single node at a time. Now, obviously, nowadays, you know, we can knock out multiple or knock down multiple genes at the, at the time. And we would like to have a strategy that can actually predict which, which ones of these, you know, multiple knockouts at the time should you, be, should you do in order to learn the most about the underlying system. All of these algorithms that we have for learning, they can use, you know, data where you have knockouts on, on multiple nodes at the same time. So all of that works in terms of learning. 
Okay, so this was a bit about, you know, how you can integrate observational and interventional data in order to learn the underlying causal graph and then based on this causal graph, try to predict the effect of an yet unseen intervention. Um, so that was all on this side of the, of the graph, um, on, these gene, on the gene regulatory side of the, of, of, um, of the problem. And now, as I said, you know, what I really am um, interested in is a question of like, how does um, this 1D information like give rise to all of these different cell types? And there it, ha it has become clear more and more that, you know, the packing of the DNA matters a lot. Um, and so the mechanical state of a cell matters a lot. And that's usually measured um, with images, right? More than, more than with, um, with expression. And um, so what we really want to be able to do is actually integrate these different kinds of data modalities. So images on one side and then gene expression or um, on the other side, or even other modalities like maybe high C data since I care about packing data. Um, and so let me now switch gears a bit uh, to talk about how to integrate different data modalities instead of, you know, just one modality in observational and interventional data. Okay, so for this, we have come to love autoencoders. Um, so what are autoencoders? So autoencoders are just a special neural network. Um, and this, what is special about it is, you know, it's not the ones used for classification, um, but it goes from, because it goes from, you know, some input space, say you have images of size, um, d by d to the same output space. So it maps images of size d by d to images of size d by d. Okay, it doesn't give you out a label. It actually gives you out, if you put in an image, it, it spits out another image. If you put, it, put in RNA-seq, it spits out an RNA-seq vector of the same dimension. Um, what is interesting about it is it consists of two parts, an encoder part, which is the first part of the neural network, and the second part, which is called the decoder. Um, and this space here in the middle is this latent space representation. And um, so this is, you can see it as a nonlinear, well, often used as dimension reduction technique. I'll be arguing that maybe it should not just be dimension reduction. Um, we'll talk about that later. But how is it trained? Well, it's trained to just reconstruct images. So you have, or reconstruct RNA-seq vectors or whatever you put in, right? You have your training examples and you just minimize, say, L2 norm of your training examples. So what that encourages, uh, the latent space here, is it encourages the latent space just to keep all of the information necessary in order to be able to reproduce the images or RNA-seq vectors themselves. Okay, so that's why this is going to be a representation of the images or your, or your data, right? Um, that keeps as much of the important information necessary in order to be able to predict, uh, to, to reconstruct the training images that you put in. Okay, so that's why, of course, you can see if it's just everything is linear and you only have one layer here, right, and you can see this as PCA, that's a very special case of this, but in general, you know, you have here multiple layers and multiple layers to go out and they're non-linear as well. Okay, so autoencoders have been used all over the place, right, in, in computer vision, et cetera, also in biology. And what I want to argue is that autoencoders are super interesting um, if you want to do this data integration problem. Okay, so how can they be used for data integration? Um, if I have, you know, say images and RNA-seq that I want to be able to translate between them, right? So really what I would like to be able to do is you give me an image of a cell and I would like to be able to generate the corresponding RNA-seq vector. Okay, so how do we do this and how do we do this with autoencoders? Okay, so first of all, Okay, so let's look at the following problem. And this is, uh, this is of course, an assumption of, the, of this particular method, is that I have a population of cells. And from this population of cells, I randomly picked out some for imaging and randomly picked out some for sequencing, say, or some for high C data or some for chip seek, whatever you want. But it's always the same population of cells. Okay, so if you, so what these different modalities are, are really different views of the same population of cells. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a latent space that kind of represents the state of the cells. Okay, so it, before I was talking about causality, so you can think of this is, you know, the wiring pattern of all of these different cells, right? So this is the state of the cell, which I don't get to observe directly, but I get to observe it through different data modalities. Okay, and so I'm, this is, uh, you know, this latent space will play an important role. So now the question is, how do I get to a good latent space representation of all these cells, right? So that it is, um, so that it actually has all of the information that I had from the images, from the RNA-seq, etc. Okay, so how am I going to use autoencoders? 
Okay, so let's take different data modalities. So here I have RNA-seq, I'll have images afterwards, DAPI stained images, I'll have say ChIP-seq, etc. And I'm going to train one autoencoder on each one of the data modalities. Okay, so I'm going to do this here. What I have here, I'm going to a latent space and I'm doing this for the images. I'm doing this separately. So for images, you usually use, I say, a convolutional network, right? Then I'm doing this separately for the RNA-seq with, say, you know, a fully connected network. I'm doing this separately for ChIP-seq data, et cetera, right? For HiC data, maybe you can use a graph neural network, et cetera. You can use any of the networks, um, you know, that are specialized to your data structure. So, okay, so I was explaining that, uh, you know, each one of these autoencoders uh, from these different data modalities has to match, has to map not only to the same latent space, but actually match to the same distributions in the latent space, right? Because, because I have this assumption that, you know, the images that it took, they come from a cell from the same population of cells and the RNA-seq also comes from the same population of cells. So obviously in the latent space, it has to be the same distribution, no matter whether I come from image land or I come from RNA-seq land or I come from chip-seq land. And how you can do this is just by, you know, like how we usually do these things with neural networks is just you add another discriminator in the latent space, which punishes me. So this discriminator, if I can actually tell whether a sample came from image land or from RNA seq land, well, then I'm going to be punished um, because, you know, I want the two distributions to actually match each other. Okay, so not only do you have a loss function that is the reconstruction loss in each one of your data modalities, but you have this additional loss in the latent space to make sure that whatever the distributions are that I get from each one of the data modalities is actually the same. And now the amazing thing about an autoencoder is that now I can actually go from one modality to another, right? So the autoencoder is a function that goes from here, say RD to RD, right? So it can go to the latent space. And in fact, I can take any point in the latent space and I can map it back in this case to images, right? So what I can do is I can take a, say RNA-seq profile, go to the latent space, with the encoder, then use a decoder of a different autoencoder to go to image space, say. And so in this way, I can actually translate between RNA-seq profiles and images and, you know, images and chip-seq and whatever data modalities that you have from the same population of cells. Okay, so this is what we did down here, um, going from RNA-seq to chip-seq, where there is actually paired data so that we can actually validate these kinds of methods. And here, just so that, you know, this is like one of the applications that it's just some toy example um, where you can actually see what is happening because it's a bit more difficult to actually look at RNA-seq and chip-seq profiles. But say, you know, my data modalities could be black-haired women, blonde-haired women, brown-haired women, blonde-haired males, black-haired males, etc. right? And so what this autoencoder then can do is take in, say, a black haired woman and then ask, how would she look like were she blonde, right? And this is a generated image. This is not a real image, right? But what I did is I took the autoencoder to go from here to a latent space. And then I took the other autoencoder that was trained on blonde hair women to go to this blonde haired space. Um, and all of these here, all of these images here are, of course, generated images. They are not real images. Okay, so exactly this is what you can do on RNA-seq, chip-seq imaging, etc. And so I want to show you, and maybe I should say, so for RNA-seq, chip-seq, there have been also other methods, um, which you probably also know, like deep CCA, etc., all kinds of methods. Um, the problem there was, and, and so why they could not be applied to, to imaging data is that they assumed they needed the dimensionalities and the variables across the different data modalities to match. Right? So for example, you can do things at gene level, so where you have variables matching each other. But of course, if you want to go from imaging images to RNA-seq, there is no variable in an image that corresponds to a gene, right? So this is, so that's where you actually need this kind of uh, model that we uh, generated with these, or that we came up with, with these different autoencoders. And here I'll actually show you how it works of going from images to RNA-seq and how we actually validated this. So the particular problem we looked at was in T-cells. Um, and so this is all a collaboration with G.V. Shibashankar's group who just moved from Singapore to ETH Zurich. And everything I've been doing with imaging is always um, in collaboration with Shiva's lab. Um, so they had a, re a paper um, in 2012 where they looked at CD4 plus T-cells and they just look at DAPI stained images. And they found that there are two different populations of cells. Um, one population of cells that, that, is, um, that has more heterochromatin in the center, so you see it here, and another population of cells that has more heterochromatin on the outside. 
Okay. And so, um, and in fact, these are also functional states. So the ones with a heterochromatin inside, they are softer T cells. They have a higher transmigration efficiency. They have accelerated activation as compared to the T cells, the CD4 plus T cells with a heterochromatin outside. So we wondered whether, you know, now this has been seen in images, right? Whether we can actually connect this to functional states in RNA-seq where we can look at, for example, which genes are the ones that are maybe driving these kinds of differences in terms of activation, efficiency, et cetera, or being poised for activation, et cetera. Okay, so what we did first, so this was done in mice, as I said. So the first thing we did is we wanted to see whether something like this can work in humans. Um, so here we looked at um, this data set, single cell RNA-seq data set in humans um, and T cells. And we found again, within the naive T cells, in basically any clustering method you, you want to, and we also looked at that they're all basically the same, they will always give you two different um, clusters of uh, T cells. Um, you see them here in blue and in green. You see them here on our PCA space in blue and in green. Here I'm just also plotting the activated st state because then you see that one of, and this is just of how we named these two. So the one that is closer to the activated state, we'll call it the state of naive T cells that is poised for activation uh, of CD4 plus T cells. And the other one, so in this case, the blue one here, which is further away from the activated state, we'll call these the quiescent uh, naive uh, CD4 plus T cells. Okay, so you see it here, there are clearly two clusters, one of them is closer to the activated state. Okay, so this is the first thing. Now, of course, we wanted to look again in images, whether we also see these two clusters, um, because, you know, this was done in mice before, and now we did here in humans, and again, you see very, very cleanly two different clusters, one that has more heterochromatin in the inside, one that has more heterochromatin in the outside. Okay, so now what we did is we used our, um, our you know, coupled autoencoder framework of going from real RNA-seq data to this latent space embedding where we have the images and the RNA-seq overlapping, right, where the two distributions are actually the same. And so using these two autoencoders, you can, for example, get, a, you know, take an image and go to the latent space and predict for each one of the cells that corresponding RNA-seq profile or the other way around. I can take RNA-seq, go to the latent space and predict the corresponding image. Now, how do you validate something like this? So as I said, you know, you can still not get a DAPI image and single cell RNA-seq done in the same image. So how, so the next best thing we're able to do is, well, so we went, oh, so first maybe validation in terms of computationally validation. Well, one thing we can at least do is, you know, go from images to RNA-seq Right, we have these two clusters of cells and we just look at the predicted differential expression of each gene in the, in the cells that are poised for activation and the quiescent ones. And we plot this versus the, you know, say the, the difference in gene expression that we actually observe. And, you know, if this was perfect, you would like that all of these points here on the diagonal, but, you know, it's, it's actually pretty good, right? So no matter whether I go from images to RNA-seq, uh, in there. So I predict the RNA-seq profile and predict what the differences are between these two clusters of cells or whether I just directly measure the RNA-seq. Um, we are actually not far off here, right, even at the gene-to-gene -gene level. But of course, this is maybe not, I mean, this is some validation, but you, know, you would really like to have a biological validation. So of course, we cannot get the full single cell RNA-seq profile paired with the imaging data. Um, the next best thing that we thought we can do is, so we looked at these two genes that are, you know, very differentially expressed in the two groups. Um, and we didn't take, I mean, we looked at all of the ones that are very differentially expressed and just chose the ones that have the best uh, fluorescent label, okay, which in this case of all of the ones up here was CORA1A and these ones up here was uh, RPL10A. And we also labeled these in the cells, okay, so now we don't have only DAPI staining, but we also have these labels of these two uh, proteins. Of course, there is a difference between RNA-seq and proteins, but what you see at least here is, you know, this is at least some validation, right, is that in fact the two different clusters, they do show a difference and the difference is going in the correct direction of this CORA1A and RPL10A labels. Okay, so at least on two genes, we were able to validate this. Now, of course, you would like to validate it on all 20,000, but I think this is already pretty nice that you can actually do it. And some other validation was already obtained before, right? I only went through it, but there are some data sets, right, that are, that are actually paired, and so we could validate it there um, that this method actually works in terms of translating between different data modalities. Okay, so how am I doing in terms of time? Okay, so um, so this is in terms of, um, you know, moving around between different data modalities. 
So now let me get to the other question that I also asked at the beginning is, you know, you also have another problem, right, where this destructiveness of, of all these different single cell methods that we have is really problematic is when you want to look at a process over time. Right. I am not able to get these standard time series data sets where I just, um, you know, follow a cell over time because getting the measurement just means destruct, destroying the cell. So that's a problem of lineage tracing, right? So what I would really like to be able to do is from measurements at different time points of the same population of cells, but of course of different cells, I would like to be able to predict how would this cell have looked like were I able to look at it also at time point two. Okay. And there has been this really nice paper coming out of the Broad um, that, um, that used, I mean, that looked at this particular problem for single cell RNA-seq and used optimal transport um, in order to move between population of cells, say, over time. Okay, so optimal transport tells you, gives you a map between different um, distributions and say, you know, these could be at different time points. It could also be at different interventions, etc. Now, if you know optimal transport, it needs to come up with a loss function of how you move in space. Okay, now for RNA-seq, you can use something like, you know, how do you measure distance between two RNA-seq profiles? Well, you can use something like L2 distance between them, right? Because you have genes, right? I can just measure differences between different genes. But how do you do this on images, right? So, so we care a lot about images, in particular, if you think of, you know, early cancer detection or anything like that, where, you know, getting access is, is still often cheaper if you look at the tissue as an image, right, instead of actually sequencing many cells. So how do you do this for images, right? So in images, I really care about this problem because I would like to be able to, you know, right now, I mean, something that I find problematic is that somehow I'll never be able to do um, cancer detection earlier than a pathologist because I'm training my models on the data that I get from pathologists, right? So how can I predict how a cell would have looked like that is now classified as cancerous? How would it have looked like at an earlier time point? Well, for that, I need to be able to make up my own data, right? So, so if I want to be able to do it earlier than a pathologist nowadays, I need to be able to predict or to, to generate my own data. And so that's exactly this optimal transport problem, right? I have the normal state and I have, say, the earliest state that the pathologist can, can detect. And now I want to know from this earliest state that the pathologist can detect, I have many cells there. Well, how would they have looked like at slightly earlier time points? Okay, so that's exactly what, you know, one could try to do using optimal transport. Now, the problem is exactly this, that how do I measure distances between cells when I have images instead of, say, RNA-seq, right? So in images, you know, pixel one doesn't mean anything or has no relationship with pixel one in another image. So you cannot just take L2 difference between images, right? You, they're not in the same coordinate system. Um, so now again, autoencoders can actually help you to do that, right? I can embed all of my images into a joint coordinate system, which is this latent space, right? Now in this latent space, and this is exactly what we did here, so we have all of these images, in this case, in four different states of cells. We embed them all into this coordinate system, which is this latent space. Now I have a joint coordinate system, and now I can actually do optimal transport, right? Now I can do this, I can actually get this map of moving, you know, from the say metastatic state back to the cancerous state, back to the fibrocystic state, back to the normal state, so this is all in, in breast. Um, and I can do this transport map, I can actually get this transport map here in the latent space. And now of course the autoencoder allows me to get back images, right? I can move around in the latent space, but then now of course I have a decoder which can go from any point here back to the image space. And so in that way I can take here, these are the only real cell images, everything else is generated. Okay, I can take a metastatic cell, I can map it to the latent space. I can use my optimal transport map to move it backwards in, in time. And then I can use the autoencoder again to actually get the corresponding image. Okay, so in this way, I can answer questions like, how would the cell have looked like at earlier time points? Okay, and we've done this here on these cell lines. We've done it also in a co-culture system of, of fibroblasts and, and cancer cells where we can actually do the experiment and validate that things like this work. And then we've also done this on tissues. Okay, so I think autoencoders are super powerful tools in order to actually move between different data modalities, move between different time points, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And when you're doing actually single cell biology. <laughs>
Okay, so um, here, this is the main work I talked about is actually how to move around and how to actually um, get this uh, to relevant problems also in pathology. Um, and maybe with that, um, since I still have a couple of minutes, I can also tell you a bit about how all of these things were useful for us when we were thinking about drug discovery in COVID-19. Um, so drug discovery in COVID-19 um, and how does it fit into causality and all this, um, you know, data integration questions. Well, you know, drug, drug discovery, well, because of the given ur the, its urgency, it's, it's mainly a drug repurposing question, right, where I would like to find drugs that are able to reverse the, the effect of SARS-CoV-2 in cells. Um, now, there are all these huge um, drug um, screens that have been performed, for example, the CMAP data set that is you know, really available also from the broad, um, which uh, many of you I'm sure know, where you have huge sample sizes, right, of these gene expression vectors with thousands of perturbations, and including, say, about 1,000 FDA-approved drugs on many different cell types. Um, and now, of course, what you would really, you know, of course, the drug has can have very different effects on different cell types. And in particular, for now, for example, for COVID-19, you care about particular cells, right? Particular cells in the lung or in the, in the airways. And so you would really like to know, well, what is the effect of these drugs on these particular cells that you care about for this particular disease? And maybe, you know, not all of these, um, not all of these drugs and knockouts and, and all these perturbations have been measured on each one of the cell type. So it's really another, it's, it's again a question of um, large scale data integration and also a causal question because of course the drug is an intervention, right? So now what I would want to be able to do is I measure the effect of a drug on one cell type and I would like to be able to predict what is its effect on a different cell type where I have not yet measured it, right? And then I can correlate that with the reverse effect of, of uh, the virus of SARS-CoV-2 and try to prioritize drugs in this way. And so again, autoencoders can be used to do this, right? So if you think about style transfer, um, that autoencoders and GANs, et cetera, have been used so much to do, is like, you know, what is this? What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to add a smile to a person, right? So I have here a person, it goes to the latent space, and this is a smiling, the per same person smiling. I get this vector out. Now I put in a new person. Um, I would like to add a smile to this person. Well, how style transfer works is I take this vector here in the latent space, I move it up to this person, okay? And I now look at what this, this point here in the latent space actually corresponds to in terms of an image, and you see that this person is actually smiling. Okay, so these, this kind of style transfer has been applied in many, many different applications. Um, and of course, I mean, if you come from machine learning, then this is probably the first kind of framework that you would like to try to apply in order to predict the effect of, an, of a drug, right? Of a drug that you know in one cell type, you want to predict it in another cell type. Well, and that's exactly what we did. Um, now, and I won't go into this, but I, I encourage you to look at it. Um, it works very well. It doesn't work well if you use standard autoencoders. It works very, very well if you use over-parameterized autoencoders. And I think we also understand why. So we have, we know now the inductive bias of over-parameterized autoencoders. Because this will only work well if these two vectors are actually aligned, right? If, if I would take another cell type where I'm also adding the same drug, then in the latent space, this vector again has to be aligned. If they're not aligned, like really parallel to each other, pointing in the same direction, well, then I can also not shift it over and hope that for a third cell type, I'm going to get the correct effect this drug. And so this over-parameterization in autoencoders actually forces these different, um, these different vectors to actually be better aligned with each other. And that's kind of what you see here. But maybe I don't want to go into, um, into too much detail. I just want to say that, you know, in this way, we're able to actually come up um, with a prioritization of drugs. And you see it came out very, very clean in the sense that we basically only found two different types of drugs, um, which, is the, which are these serine trionine protein kinases and then these receptor tyrosine kinases and some other drugs, right? It's only these, these three here. So it's a pretty clean picture for that, that this is biological data. Um, we weren't expecting it to be so clean. And when it's so clean, then we're just like, makes you very happy that, you know, there is a real signal in here um, that you're able to, to get out of this. And then you can also look at the mechanisms of these drugs. Now, of course, again, with single cell RNA-seq data with the kinds of methods that we looked at at the beginning of the talk, right? I can now look at, well, you know, I have particular drugs here, for example, and here are their targets. 
Um, and I can look at, well, I would like that the drug targets are upstream of the differentially expressed genes um, by the virus, right? Differentially expressed in terms of with uh, SARS-CoV-2 or without SARS-CoV-2. And what is nice is this RIPK1 is in fact upstream of you know, most of the genes, um, whether you do it in A549 cells or in A2 cells. It just has a super interesting protein and um, you can look at the paper. And it's also, it has been found to directly bind to SARS-CoV-2 proteins, which is of course not something that we put into the analysis when we, when we um, started this analysis. Um, so I think it's a very interesting um, target that was found um, through this analysis. And now of course it's about validating this as well. Um, okay, so I think uh, this, this uh, integration of different data modalities and, and in particular uh, causality also leads to broadly applicable causal drug discovery platforms, which I think needs still quite a lot of work. We have these two papers here um, in terms of how we applied this and, you know, the thinking behind it. And with that, I want to stop and thank, of course, none of this work would have been possible without an amazing group of PhD students, master students, undergrads, postdocs, collaborators, and then, of course, um, a lot of funding. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Caroline. This is such a, a, a um, kind of radical new perspective for me, and I suspect for a lot of us um, to think about to think about some of these problems. Um, there are a number of questions here that came in on the poll. So I'm going to start with the most uh, upvoted ones here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the imaging data, does it need to be single cell images or multiple cells can be present on the same image? Yeah, and so then, then you have, mm -hmm. okay. And then if single cell images only, would multi-cell images need to be segmented? Um, for the training of auto encoders. Yes. So let me go back to that um, little picture. So the thing is that, you know, what we're doing, I mean, okay, so it, what, what has to happen is that you have the same, that you're doing the same thing in all of your data modalities. So if you're taking some aggregates in your RNA-seq, then you can take some aggregates, although this is like harder to do in your images, right? So it just has to be kind of the same things that you're measuring in all of them so that the distributions actually match in the latent space. Now, I don't know how you would think of aggregates in your images, but what we do is we segment them. Because we're looking at single cell RNA-seq, um, we're segmenting the images. Now, we've also thought of, you know, sometimes you don't have single cell RNA-seq, but you have aggregates there and you have many different uh, vectors. So maybe you would want to match multiple images to one particular point. Um, in the RNA seq land or in some other data modality, um, and there are ways of doing that, but but that's harder to do, and one has to think a bit more carefully about it. For now, it's all single cells. What we've done here, right. just to get the the populations. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking okay. at the same yeah. cells. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question, I think you sort of addressed, but um, but it's enough like magic for many of us that it might it, it's worth asking this. Again, what is the advantage of reconstructing the missing modalities with the decoder phase rather than work directly in the low dimensional latent space? Oh, okay. This is a good question. Yes. Yeah. So I think it depends on what you're asking, right? Um, so, so if I would want, okay, so, so this latent space, I think is really nice that it, con that it contains all of the information of the two modalities. So if you want to do clustering or, you know, anything like that, you, I would do it in the latent space, right? Because it contains all of this. It's an aggregate of all of these different data modalities. And I also think of it, and we of course don't really have a proof of it, but as being more causal than anything else outside, because you know it's kind of it's only containing the information that is consistent across different ways of viewing the data. Um, so for any of those kinds of questions, I would do it in the latent space, right? But you know, in terms of um, inter in terms of interpretability, I think. I think this decoder, what it really helps you is to get an interpretation of what these latent space components mean or what the, di what the di different directions mean. Um, and that's often what we do, right? So, so in an image, right, I say I have two different clusters, um, which is what we had for these different T cells, right? And I can walk into, I can, in the latent space, and I have the two clusters, I can walk into this particular direction. And now I can look at, well, what happens in gene expression land if I, if I actually do this? 
right? And I can, I can take like a, a very small step in latent space and I can look at, I just take the differences between them in say RNA-seq space and I see which ones of the genes are actually changing when I'm doing this kind of direction walk. And the same is what we did, and here it was very important when we looked at these cancer cells, right, where I wanted to walk backwards in time. So here again, it was very important that I can go back to the imaging space because I would take a little walk into the direction of earlier time points, and I would take the differences of the images, and that gives me biomarkers, right? That gives me biomarkers for the process that I actually care about. Um, so it just, this decoder helps you in terms of interpretability. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you only learn shared latent spaces if you have multiple modalities for the same cell? Because there are some assays that give you multiple modalities, say for the same tissue, but unmatched cells. Oh, sorry. So all of this was not matched cells. So yes, so you can do that in tissues, right? So, so this is important to say. So actually here, since we cannot measure in the same cell DAPI staining and RNA-seq, we never measured it in the same cell. Okay, oh, so it's basically the same as what you're asking, like we have a tissue and some cells were taken out for imaging and some cells were taken out for sequencing. So we never had any paired measurements, but the distribution should be the same because we're assuming that they were randomly sampled, the ones that go for imaging and the ones that go for sequencing. So the distribution in the latent space should be the same. Right, so that's what we're using. We're only using the paired data that is available where, you know, the two things are, you know, the same things is measured in the same cell for validation to show that this method can actually work. So how would it be different than if you, if you were using data with the multiple modalities on the same cells? Oh, but usually you don't have that. So whenever we have this, so, okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have it, you can add it in as an additional loss function because you also say here, I know that this cell here corresponds to this cell. Well, if I map them to the latent space, they should be matching on top of each other. So whenever I have some of this, you know, data that is already paired, I can just add in, in the loss function. I can just add in another term that pun punishes me if they're not close by. So in that way, so, so all of this can be used for semi-supervision and we use all kinds of different things for semi-supervision. So one of these things is if you have some paired data, and of course, usually you have a whole lot of unpaired data, well, you can just for the paired data, you can add in this additional okay. loss function. This will, of course, help you to get a better embedding of the latent space, right? You don't have to infer as many things because you can add in some, some knowledge that you already have. Um, also, you can add other things for semi-supervision. For example, if you take two different cell types, right, and you have imaging data and, and sequencing data, well, you already know that the two different cell types should match to each other. So again, you can add that in as to regularize your latent space a bit more. Or here, for example, you might know a particular uh, marker that corresponds to differentiation. Here, we're looking at embryonic stem cells. So we added this in, right, that, you know, this axis of differentiation should correspond to the axis of differentiation in RNA-seq. So you can say that these two things have to be aligned in the latent space. So anything you know already, you should, of course, add it in, in terms of semi-supervision. It's a very flexible approach. Uh, the next question, I had been wondering this too. Um, what was the sample size for uh, training the autoencoder? And further, do you think using variational autoencoder uh, would work even, even better. And I always wonder this about approaches that, it, that have been successful in image analysis where there are millions of images being applied to, to biological problems where we have you know, many fewer observations. Yep, yeah, so here also we only have about a thousand, thousand images or so. Of course, single cell RNA-seq was much more, right? Because that's just, you usually have much larger data sets there. So that's enough, I mean, all of our, all of our experiments or all of the methods that we have developed also previously were always on the images. It was always of the order of a thousand. Um, so in terms of variational autoencoders and usual normal autoencoders, um, so that's a very good question. So usually when you work with images, so what do you, why do you use variational autoencoders? It's just so that, you know, when you actually move around in the latent space that it will actually give you a nice image out, right? So if you care about this decoding, um, a lot, right, so that you actually, because you want them to have mass everywhere in this probability space so that what you get out actually really corresponds to a real looking image or a real looking expression pattern, etc. However, you know, these variational autoencoders, they're pushing you to become more Gaussian in the latent space. 
right? So um, that's a problem when you want to align different distributions because when you have completely, you know, the variational auto encoder, you can actually use it, but just you should use it with a very small penalty on the variational part. Because if you make it completely Gaussian, then I can align any distribution, uh, you know, I can rotate the data sets, right? And I have no more structure in the latent space. It's all up to rotation. So then of course the matching is not going to be as good. Um, so if you use a variational one, just use it with a very small penalty um, so that it doesn't make it too Gaussian because you're, you're getting rid of all of the structure you're using in order to align the two different modalities. Yeah. Um, I think you've made a good case for autoencoders, but there are a number of people who are interested in, in what advantage they have over basic dimension reductions like PCA or NMF. Yeah, so we did always compare to PCA. I mean, okay, so actually maybe I can go to this. Um, let me do the drugs. Um, okay, so PCA is of course linear, right? And actually I, I will say it for each one of the applications, but since here I have a plot for what happens with PCA, I can show this one. Okay, so PCA, I can do PCA. Um, here I wanted to get this drug alignment, right? So if I just use, for example, the first two principal components, I get a perfect alignment of these drugs that you see here. They're like all at basically all centered at one, one or minus one, minus one. However, I got this by just, you know, getting rid of all of my data, right? I basically threw away all of the data. I can actually not reconstruct it. I can, you know, if I, if I look at, if I want to do the classification task, were you a perturbation or were you not? Well, it's basically like random guessing. Um, so, however, if I use an autoencoder here, in this case, even an overparameterized one, you know, I still get this alignment properties, but I also get actually because it's overparameterized, perfect reconstruction, right? So, and so that's the thing. I mean, these autoencoders, first of all, they have the implicit, the inductive bias that you actually want. They do align these kinds of features um, that we like them to align and we understand why. And the other thing is, of course, they are nonlinear, right? Um, they can actually get an embedding that is nonlinear. It's not the case that, you know, here, if you take, I mean, I don't know, maybe if I go to this, the one where I'm moving around in space, right? Even if I'm moving around linearly in this latent space here, it can correspond to something very, very non-linear in the imaging space, right? And that's really what you're making use of is like somehow like this autoencoder, what these non-linearities do that match you into a latent space, it will make structures uh, that are, you know, as we saw there, more aligned, more linear. But of course, linear here can mean something very, very complicated outside, which is not something you can get when you do PCA, right? You, also with PCA, I mean, you'll never be able to, usually, to, um, to completely reconstruct your image, right? Um, so there are, yeah, as in, right. unless you take all of your vectors, of course. So I think there are a lot of advantages in that, mainly the nonlinearity, of course, and then the depth, yeah. All right, thank you so much. And I can say, even though it, it, it feels like you're talking to yourself in this format, we've had consistently, I don't know, 130 or so uh, people watching it all the times, and there will be quite a bit, a few more watching again later. And um, I think we've all learned a lot from your talk. So I really appreciate your, your attending virtual BioC 2020. And thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. And it was really fun to do this and it was really fun to watch your talk. Thank you. Great, thank you.